up everybody this is Derek Kirby my mic is indeed live and this is the Dallas prospect it's a new day and another shot at the title so we're here with another Mavericks live stream to talk about what this team can do to get better and whether or not they're even headed on the right path necessarily B Rob first in the house what's good let me know, what'd you guys think of the new video intro, by the way? I have worked a long time putting that together. I don't know that it's quite perfected. I might still tweak it a little bit, but I like it. I dig it. What up, Trevor? So first, we got to talk about the biggest impact on the Mavericks roster that we're looking at right now. That being the fact that the Bulls are reportedly very interested in acquiring Maxi Kleba. This would be part of a sign-and-trade deal for Laurie Marketing. The Mavericks are very interested in Laurie Marketing. Go figure. Now, what we have to consider here is the trade-off, right? Marketing is a talented player, a player who I think can certainly elevate beyond what we've seen in Chicago. However, there are some concerns as well. I love Maxi Kleba on this team. He is great for what this team needs. He's a perfect fit. He's also 29 going on 30. He's also a guy who never last year, and you don't know if it was just the end of last year or if it's going to just kind of be the new standard. He's not quite the defender post-COVID that he was before. He's still a good, versatile defender. He still shot over 41% from three. My concerns would basically be a front court, defensively speaking, a front court of Kristaps Porzingis and Laurie Markkinen, whoo, that's not good. That's not good. And so that's my immediate reservation, right? When we're looking at it, we say, does this make the team better? Well, you are getting a better offensive player. You're getting a guy that can score for you, certainly more than Maxi. Maxi's a guy, as much as I love him, he's not put up big numbers. He's been efficient in terms of his three-point shooting, but that hasn't even translated into the postseason. And so you kind of have this mixed bag wherein Maxi is a good fit here, but I think he's at or at the very least very near his ceiling already. And again, 29 going on 30, and in the postseason the past two years, has not been well. If you look at the last few games of that series this year against the Clippers, he was not any kind of impact. He regressed significantly. Let me pull up the exact figures on that. Uh, the last few games of the series, so game one, 36 minutes. Game two, 34 minutes. Game three, 35 minutes. It wasn't until he hit game five, six, and seven that he borderline bottomed out. 19 minutes. 21 minutes, nine minutes. This was this was a must-have moment for the Mavericks, and he was not able to help them in that regard. He wasn't able to chip in like you needed. His point scoring for the series were 6, 13, 14, 0, 4, 0, and 0. You see where this is a little bit of a concern. So purely on the basis of acquiring young, still promising talent, again, marketing's 24 years old, 24 years old, you're getting a player that's five years younger, has a higher ceiling, and at the very least, uh, a stronger scorer for this team that I think they need. Now, do I think he's walking in here and becoming the new number two? No, no, I don't think that's going to be the case, but I do think you're looking at a situation where you can add a guy who last year averaged 13.6 points, 5.3 boards, and that's compared to 7.1 points for Maxi, 5.2 rebounds. Maxi's biggest benefits for Dallas have been his efficiency in three-point shooting. Again, 41% last year. That's great. That's the main reason the Bulls are interested in him and the fact that he has been able to defend. But even that kind of regressed, and at or near his ceiling especially after, you know, dealing with COVID last year, he regressed a little bit. And by the last stretch of that Clipper series, he really couldn't offer anything to the Mavericks. And that is a, that's a tough situation to be in. So purely on the basis of talent acquisition, 
I think it makes sense for Dallas, especially when you're considering that they're looking to pay marketing around $14 million thereabouts per year. That sounds fair, given what he is as a player. My concern, this is not a splash move. This is a, to me, a risky move that could pay off. But again, I think it doesn't get you, this one move does not take you where you need to go, right? This isn't going to make you suddenly a better team that you look at and say, oh, this team's getting out of the first round this year. It does not accomplish that. But even if it doesn't work out, you're still acquiring a young talent who presumably can elevate his game playing alongside Luka Doncic, something that Maxi, while a very good player for several years for Dallas, hasn't really been able to do in the way you would hope. You're getting a, a good young player and prospect who you can hopefully elevate the value of and then still have a, as a commodity come trade deadline. Like, I'm not saying like this deadline. I'm saying like if you acquire marketing and it doesn't work out after a couple of years, you could always move him as part of a bigger deal. And I think that you have to consider that in the total package of what we're looking at here. I think defensively, you're looking at a train wreck with KP and marketing as your front court. You just are. And I don't think you could start them together because of that. I think you would have to bring marketing off the bench, in which case you say, all right, uh, does does that necessarily fix the issues? If we want him playing with Luca to rate to raise his game, we know Luca is going to get a, a high number of minutes, especially since Dallas seems completely adamant on the fact that they're not really going to acquire a, a quality point guard to go alongside Luca or playmaker. You know, we'll see what happens on the Dragic front, but it still seems like that's kind of up in the air, and Toronto's really in the driver's seat there. So we'll see if that happens. But Dallas. They're not they're not making a move on Goran, it doesn't seem like, unless he is bought out and comes free because they don't want to pay him $19 million this year that he's owed. So that complicates things. And if they were to do that, that would have required another big deal. You do have five centers on the roster. You have, or is it seven? You have way too many big men on the roster as is. Oh, streaming fine. Looks like the reconnection was successful. OBS popped up and was telling me that there was a, an interruption, but it seems like it stabilized. So with that being the case, you have to consider, like, the team's making moves, but are they moves that actually make the team better and elevate their ceiling for where they can go compared to last year and the year before? Or are these just moves because it's a new front office? Everybody knows the, the frustration and disappointment that's come about in free agency year after year after year after year after year, after year to the point where... Our biggest celebration is, is what? What's our biggest free agent acquisition celebration that we've had post-title? Getting DeAndre Jordan the second time? Is that it? I know we weren't celebrating Monte Ellis when that happened. Now, that was a good fit. Monte, for a year and a half, was a damn good Maverick. And he's trying to mount an NBA comeback right now, actually. But I don't know. I don't think that that's necessarily... I don't, I don't think that you could make a great argument that Dallas has had any success, frankly. They've done good in scramble mode, like letting the main moves play out and then kind of picking over the scraps to find serviceable items, but serviceable talent isn't going to get you anywhere. You can't just wait for a Kevin Durant to go to Golden State so you can go pick up the scraps of Harrison Barnes on a max contract. You can't make way doing that at some point you have to figure out how to move forward. And I feel like with this new front office and say what they will, say what they want, they can repackage it, they can address it however they want. They sold us on the idea that they understood this was a crucial offseason and that their number one focus was acquiring a number two scorer and a guy that could take pressure off of Luka, a.k.a. another ball handler, another playmaker, a guy who could probably play point for Dallas. And then when all of that fell through, suddenly the messaging turned into like, well, hey, you know, we'd like to acquire one of those guys, but we've already got a pretty good point guard, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we got Luca. We're good. It, it It's, uh, it's kind of gaslighting, right? Like it, it's taking that telling us you understand our concerns and that you share those concerns. And then when you 
failed to actually deliver on it, turning around and saying, no, 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 we're good. You're the problem if you think that that was the problem. Mm, I don't share that opinion. But even still, this is a... I, I got to wonder, like, is this a move that actually makes us better? Or is this a move where it's like, hey, that's a, a promising young talent with some name value and recognition, some intrigue around the league. Maybe if we swung a sign and trade deal based around Maxi for marketing, maybe that fits. And then, hey, we find a way to get Goran after after some time and that fits. Huh? There's two moves that fans should be happy about, but does it make you better? Or did you just make moves to make moves and say that you did something? You have to consider the fit. That's what I'm saying. We made this mistake in the 2014-2015 season when the Mavericks had a very, very good offense, a, a historic pace offense at the time with Monte Ellis, Dirk, say what you will, but Chandler Parsons, Tyson Chandler in his second go-around, and the one weakness in that lineup was the point guard, Jameer Nelson. No disrespect to Jameer Nelson. He was already past his best days. So with that, the Mavericks felt pressure. They realized, hey, uh, we think we have our core of the future going forward with this lineup, but we need to make something better. And they saw an, an option, an, uh, a, a way to acquire a still pretty young championship point guard, defender, floor general, all those things that they said, hey, Jason Kidd did all these things for us. That was the missing piece. Oh, look, we can go get Rajon Rondo. But did they consider the fit? Did they consider the personality? No, no to both. They didn't consider either of those things. They saw the name, they felt the pressure to make a move, and they went for it. And they said, we think we can make this our core of the future, our lineup of the future. Tyson, Dirk, Parsons, Monte, Rondo. It completely destroyed that team. It took a team that had been riding high for two-thirds of the season and ground it into dust to the point where the Mavericks had to literally kick Rondo off the team basically in the middle of their playoff series in the opening round against the Rockets. That's how bad it got. And why didn't it work? Well, the personality aspect, Rondo, uh, Rondo, huh, Rondo, was especially then, still today a little bit, but especially then, a diva. Carlisle is a control freak. That never changed. And, well, I guess it somewhat ebbed over time, but it never went away. And so Carlisle was too strict, too limiting, too controlling, and Rondo basically acted out. Decided he wasn't, at times, going to try. Got, like, eight-second call violations, walking the ball up the floor, just completely lollygagging in a playoff game, which is ridiculous and it completely destroyed that team you had two guys that were ball dominant monte and rondo they had to have the ball in their hands to be productive and you had one not work out because the fit didn't make sense and he was clashing with the coach and his effort wasn't there and then you had other problems with monte where now because the ball's not in his hand his out his lack of an outside shot crippled his productivity. That's why I said Monte had a good year and a half with the Mavericks in his two-year stint. So you completely blew up that team. They went away. Tyson left for Phoenix in free agency, although it sucked to watch Dallas let Tyson walk away again. Phoenix gave Tyson like $90 million, which was obscene for what Tyson was at that point. I wanted to keep Tyson. I love Tyson. But for that contract, no thank you. And I say that as a huge Tyson Chandler fan. And uh, Rondo, obviously gone. Monte, left. Parsons, might have been around one more year. I can't recall exactly. I think he was gone too. And I think that was the year they brought in the offseason. They brought in Harrison Barnes on the max contract. So yeah, just an utter dumpster fire that you said, hey, this is our core of the future. And oh my God, we're left with only Dirk again. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to consider fit. And that's, and I'm not saying, like, obviously that's an extreme, extreme, extreme example. But I do think it has some relevance here as it relates to the f defensive fit for Markkanen and Porzingis on the floor together. I think that's going to be a nightmare to fit. We'll see. I don't, I don't know how it's going to go. I am always in favor of acquiring talent, especially talent that you think can raise to a higher ceiling, given 
my feelings, you know, I, I think once I took off some of my rosy goggles or fandom goggles, as it were, for Maxi and looked at it purely as, can we trust that he'll sustain this level or even go higher? I've been saying for months, if not two years already, I don't think you can keep trusting and assuming he's going to reach higher. Same with Dorian Finney-Smith. They've had great, they, they've greatly exceeded all expectations when they were undrafted. But I think at some point, you have to consider that. And so, on the basis of talent acquisition, do I think acquiring a player that's five years younger is a better score? Yes, he has defensive liabilities. Yes, he has some injury issues. But do I think that makes more sense than trying to essentially run back the exact same squad as last year with Sterling Brown and Bullock in tow? I think that's worth considering. I do. I think you have to, at this point, consider moving with this trade. And that's, that's to be clear, that's a reversal of where I stood on this trade, even as recently as yesterday. When I was talking about this in the community tab, I was still pretty strongly against the move. But the more I've gone over it in my mind and looked at it from different angles, the more I think, you know, this doesn't sound like an unreasonable move. I don't think long-term it's the right option for us. It's not like you can just do this and say, ha, we're done. But I think you can, for the time being, work with a little bit of wiggle room to make a subsequent move perhaps materialize on the heels of this. It's also one of those moves that might kind of signal long-term, like, hey, K the KP thing didn't work out, but we might have Laurie Market in now, and, you know, he's not going to be your number two guy, but you can do kind of some of those same things, if not in the same, obviously, unicorn framework. So... I don't know. We'll see. Let me know. What do you guys what do you guys think? What do you feel towards this? I would like to see Dallas do something. I don't know that this is necessarily the perfect move, but I think if this is the only way you can pull it off, it might be worth going ahead and rolling the dice. Now, whilst all of that is going on, I will update the layout here one moment. Ha. Huh? Ha. Huh. Uh, where'd it go? Ha! Topic number two. J.J. Barea is back to the Dallas Mavericks in a role yet to be defined. It seems pretty clear he's going to be a coach for the Mavericks at some point. We know he has a standing invitation to join Jason Kidd's coaching staff. What's not clear is how soon he'll step into that role. He has... In an interview with Mavs.com's Eddie Sefko, acknowledged, yeah, he loves, loves coaching. Every time he does it, he feels better. He enjoys it more. He absolutely believes his future lies in coaching. That's good for Doncic because he is one of those guys Luca always respected and took to in this organization. Like, when Luca came in, he still didn't speak English all that well. He was more comfortable speaking Spanish, and hey, J.J. Barea from Puerto Rico. They spoke Spanish, and so it was an easy connection for Luca to make right out of the gates while he continued to kind of learn English and improve in that regard. And so, between Barea's leadership and his experience and all of that, it made for an easy situation uh, for the two of them to kind of form a bond. And Berea is one of the few guys, Luca, and I don't say this to be critical of Luca, but you have to get respect or give respect to get it in a lot of cases. And I think he took quickly to Berea. Berea earned his respect quickly, and that made it easier then for Luca to kind of take his feedback a little bit more open, uh, openly than he would some other people. So that was a big gain for the Mavericks, being able to keep Bray around even if his on-court role was shrinking, especially after his Achilles tear. They brought him back the next year, and even though he barely played, 
It was good having him around because Luca liked, listened, and respected him. Listened to and respected him. And not bringing him back last year was a little bit of a confusing move. If you remember, they originally signed Berea to a new deal and then released him, but it was a parting gift to give him that final, I can't remember if it was like two or four million dollars, basically, as a thank you and uh, to show their appreciation as a franchise for everything he meant to the team, whether it was the title team, whether it meant it was his second stint in Dallas after uh, going to Minnesota initially post-title. Whatever the case, it was something that was a nice gesture, but nevertheless, you had people around the team, people who cover the team, like ESPN's Tim McMahon, basically commenting, I don't know that that's a good move to wave Berea. Yeah, you have other guards on here that you'd say, like, hey, yeah, we'd like to make sure they get minutes, but Berea, even if he's just sitting at the end of the bench 90% of the year, his impact and influence in the locker room and with regard to the, the maturation of Luca is critical. Like, that is a very important element he brings that is not being considered enough here. And, you know, I think in year three of Luca, we've seen throughout his career, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. We know this. We talk about, like, hey, he has to mature. He has to kind of grow in this regard. But you really saw, I think, last year, some of that frustration and impatience with Luca. He seemed more combative than ever. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm quite certain he acquired more technical fouls for arguing with officials or being demonstrative in his body language on the floor than his prior two seasons. And I think that's an area where Berea could help. When you're trying to reel a guy in, like if, if Luca and Carlisle didn't necessarily like each other, and especially if they clashed at times and really didn't like each other, then Carlisle trying to be the guy to reel in Luca probably wouldn't work. Jamal Mosley, uh, who the Mavericks didn't really, unfortunately, give real consideration to as the head coach. He's now the coach at Orlando. I think he had the ability to get Luca's ear and get him to listen a little better. And that probably helped, but it's still not the same as like Berea talking to Luca based on what we've heard about their relationship. And, you know, then on the Mosley thing as well, you also had speculation or kind of hearsay from people around the team who covered him that Carlisle was a little bit jealous of Mosley's ability to connect with Luca and felt like it was um, a little bit of a threat, I guess. Threat feels like a strong word, but a little bit of a an adversarial role to his own his own status as the Mavericks coach, like the future of the organization. I don't know if that's true, but regardless, it is something worth noting that the guys who get Luca's ear have a lot of influence and the guys who can't seem to get it, i.e. Carlisle, they're not here now or they don't stay in Dallas very long. So I don't know. I'm not saying Luca's manufacturing any of these moves, to be clear. I think the organization is basically reading and assessing the situation and then making decisions based on what they're observing. So we'll see. But I think Berea coming back to Dallas, even if he's not an immediate coach now, even if he's more of like a scout right now, if he's going to join the coaching staff within the next year or so, I think that's a, a big win. And just having him around in any capacity, I think, is good for Dallas and good for Luka. So, and if Dallas were to acquire Goran Dragic, that's another guy that Luka obviously has immense admiration for very good friends. Dragic wants to play here with Luka. It's just a matter of what they can accomplish, what they can do. Dallas isn't going to pay $19 million for Dragic. They're just not. So if, uh, if he's bought out from Toronto or if they can work out the details of a, a move somehow that makes it, you know, more pal palatable for them, then Dragic will be here, and that'll be another very positive influence on Luka. And in the case of Dragic, you get a guy who on the floor can still, you know, provide you a little bit of lift and take a little bit of that burden off of Luka as well. So I'm all for it. I'm for it. That's how emphatic I am. Uh, all right, rolling to topic number three. So... 
The Mavericks have a new two-way contract player, that being Oregon big man Eugene Omoyuri. I might have said that right. I might not have. I practiced. I tried. He signs a two-way contract with the Mavericks, and then in a matter of, what, 48 hours? 24 hours? Plays a summer league game against the Sacramento Kings, in which case he delivers a flagrant two foul and is subsequently punched in the face by the man he fouled. Now, the Kings were throwing an alley-oop on the plate. You know what? Actually, I'll just play the clip for a second, and then we'll, we'll jump back. Hold on. Watch the clip here for yourself. Six, six. Now, both players were ejected in the game. Uh, like I said, a flagrant two was assessed on Omayuri, and I think that's probably the right call. Like, I think, to be honest, I feel like it's a dangerous foul, and for that reason, it falls in the grounds of a flagrant two. And I think the fact that it's escalated is the, based on the fact that it led to a skirmish, right? It led to a punch being thrown, which subsequently got the assailant, in this case, um, suspended a game. So there you go. From what I understand, that player had been previously injured on a similar play in which he came down awkwardly on his wrist and missed some time. So I can understand him being a little bit prickly about a dangerous foul like that. But yeah, I don't know what to make of Eugene. He's a he's a good big man from Oregon, was productive. But you bring him on on a two-way contract. He has shown some nice flashes for Dallas in the summer league. Let's see, he's a 6'6 from Oregon, originally from Ontario. Interesting. And his averages going into the last couple games were 17.1 points, 5.4 rebounds, 1.5 steals in 30 minutes of play on 47% shooting and 37.6% from three. So yeah, pretty good in that regard. A nice summer league prospect. I don't see him really pushing to get roster burn. It just seems like one of those guys that'll probably mostly sit in the D league, come up a little bit here and there just to kind of serve as reserve depth, maybe see a little bit of what he can do. But it's a nice acquisition. It's unfortunate for him that right after he he signs the two-year deal, he gets punched in the face, and now he kind of looks uh, like the jerk of this situation for inflicting the dangerous foul. But, you know, it is, it is what it is. I, I think largely no one got hurt on the play. The... Both of them being ejected for the infraction and then the guy who threw the punch being suspended a game. I think that's really all you need to say about it and you just kind of move on. Now, if he racks up, uh, if Eugene Oromori racks up a few more of these instances, then yes, at that point you look at it and you say, okay, we might have a dirty player here and that's more concerning. But based on what we see in this play, I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt and just say, you know, poise lacking in that moment maybe lost his head just a little bit took a little bit of a dangerous foul and thankfully no one got hurt from it yeah i actually davis i agree someone by all means let me know because i hear it too and it drives myself insane when i hear it regardless i think dallas needs to by all means assess their roster see what they can find in these summer league ranks, but we're not going to get a lot. It's been a largely disappointing summer league performance from the Mavericks. I know they're about to play the Heat next. We haven't seen a whole lot of Tyrell Terry. We've seen flashes. But that kind of explains his Mavericks career thus far in general. Uh, he didn't get a lot of burn last year, but he had a few moments where you saw, at least in the term of an, uh, a singular play, that you said oh, wow, that was nice, or that was nifty, that was crafty, but you haven't seen enough of it to really tell you if it's going to work. I'm actually, I'm still hopeful he can provide some kind of role to this team, but my, my faith and my belief in that is wavering a little bit now as we move through the summer league and we're not seeing that. It's a little bit concerning where he might stand. I don't know all the details, obviously, of why he was away from the team for so long last year. 
personal matter. Sounds like he's in a better place. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think you're going to find a lot of guys performing in the summer league. Again, Josh Green, because he was on Australia's goal, or excuse me, bronze medal Olympic basketball run, he was on that roster. I specify on that roster because he barely played. Because he was there, he's not in summer league. Moses Brown, a Maverick that people are interested in, that was acquired in the Josh Richardson trade. You're not going to see him, unfortunately. The fact that he's not playing, I think, is deafening in what it says and what it implies about the Mavericks. They didn't want him. They didn't want to acquire him. They didn't go into the Josh Richardson trade and say, like, oh, yeah, and uh, Moses Brown, that kid, seven foot two, nine foot three inch or whatever wingspan. Yeah, uh, or standing reach. Yeah, we want him. They didn't, uh, they didn't say that. That was a guy that was thrown in, from what I understand, from the Boston side of the table because they were trying to maneuver as efficiently as they could as well. And so Dallas basically said, like, all right, we'll take on the smallest contract you have. He's damn sure that, not even paid $2 million. I don't like that you acquire a guy like that who... I, I wrote an article on him for the Smoking Cuban, and I even did a video adaptation here talking about it. He's an intriguing prospect, but I really tap the brakes on people assuming he can come in here and be the next Tyson or the next guy who's an everyday starting center or anything like that. I think he's, in small doses, impactful, kind of like in the way that Boban can be impactful. And that comparison should kind of tell you plenty. You can use him, but you're not going to play him every day. And you're probably going to have to you're, you're going to have to work with him because I think there's things he needs to grow and develop in, and I don't think the Mavericks ever really had expectations for him. So I think they're basically hanging on to him for now until they can move him in a separate deal or something like that. There's some I can't remember the exact deadline. There's some deadline that they have to reach uh, before they can flip that. So we'll see. Lindy, what up? Bizarre, what's good? Nate Carroll. Marco Gaming. Goat, what's good? Jose, do you think we can trade for Carl Anthony Towns if Minnesota misses the playoffs again next year? Dude, that would be a dream come true. Uh, you know, he's got his own kind of defensive issues, which, you know, how many of those guys do you really want to acquire, I guess? But at the same time, I just don't know what, uh, what the likelihood is, and I think it would be a king's ransom that we might not even be able to pay. So unless you're talking a multi-team trade, I don't know. As far as trading Dwight Powell, I know that's a very popular option out there for people. I think it's worth considering. The problem is, in the case of like the marketing trade, that's not who the Bulls said they want. All the indications are that they want Maxi, And so you can't just be like, no, you're going to take Dwight Powell and be happy about it. That's not going to work, unfortunately. The Bulls want Maxi's uh, efficient three-point shooting and their perception that he's still a very versatile big who can guard perimeter players incredibly well, even in the playoffs. And that's not really what we saw this past year in the playoffs, but we definitely got to see it two years ago. So I don't know. I think in that regard, ha, dang it, you're in my head now, Davis. You're in my head. Get out of my head. Um, I think you have to consider whether or not you can move Dwight Powell effectively. We talked about, hey, you could do a deal with Toronto and make that work where you know he's $11 million and you throw him in and say Brunson, even though I like Brunson. You could make those two work together and acquire Dragic that way, but Dallas seems pretty... Uh, pretty adamant that they don't want to do that. They don't want to have to give up assets to get a player they think they could acquire anyway. And they do. And that that's just comes down to if Goron and Toronto can reach an agreement for a buyout because he wants to be here. Dallas just says, hey, if we can get him anyway, why would we give up assets to get him and pay him $19 million? So, Yeah. That's what we're looking at here. I think for Dallas, 
They need to show that they can continue moving forward their assessment of their roster right now. It, it seems pretty clear it's going to be a different roster, right? New front office, new direction, new adjustments after another year of the same old same ultimately couldn't take them where they wanted to go. They're going to make moves. We've already kind of seen that, whether it was the Richardson move, um, whether it was acquiring Reggie Bullock and Sterling Brown. We see the kind of three-point shooting acumen they've brought in. But we also have to consider the big picture. It's more than just bringing in three-point shooting. Are you giving up everything defensively? If you have Goron and Markkanen, how does your defense look? Probably not that good. And if you're then going to say, hey, we got this seven foot two inch prospect who could give us at least some minutes off the bench and be a productive member when he's out there. A guy who Luca could certainly make look like a million bucks. I mean, hell, he looked really good at times in Oklahoma City and they were trying to tank. He had a game of 23 or 20 points and 23 rebounds against the Celtics. Like, you see those things and you say, hey, this could kind of help. And Dallas seems to be saying, nah. We didn't really want him in the first place. We're just kind of hanging on to him. We'll flip him at some point as part of some other transaction. Eh. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how they navigate these waters because there is so much that is unknown. All we do know is any moves that are made now are going to be kind of supplemental moves that might change a little bit of the, the chemistry and the feel on the court, but we don't know how it's going to play out in the other aspects. If you're getting Dragic, that's a that's a nice addition, but it is a guy with a lot of mileage, and it is, you know, uh, a situation where you're not going to have the kind of defensive help you usually like to pair with Luka in, in terms of the perimeter. And then you have Markkanen, and that's very concerning. <laughs> That's very concerning defensively for me, and especially a guy who's had his own issues with uh, staying healthy. So, I don't know. I don't know. Offense is all we need, 2007 Suns, baby. Yeah, the problem is we... I, Luca's special. Special, special. Certainly could fit that Steve Nash mold, but we don't have an Amari Stoudemire on this team. <laughs> that really works when you have an Amari Stoudemire and a Sean Marion in his prime already on the team. Speaking of Sean Marion, Tyler Bay was allowed to walk. He's now with Chicago, and after a little bit of a rough start, had himself a nice couple games, making some things happen, and he's got a Sean Marion comp as his uh, player comp. So, yeah, yeah. It hurts me every day to think about how we traded Seth Curry for Josh Richardson in a second-round pick, and then literally one year later, the second-round pick, and Josh Richardson were gone. And I look at what uh, what shooters, perimeter shooters, three-point shooters, got in free agency this year, whether we're talking Duncan Robinson, whether we're talking about former Maverick Doug McDermott, what they got in free agency this year, how paid these guys got who were one-trick ponies. And then I look, and then I look at what we were paying for... Seth Curry, what the 76ers are now paying for Seth Curry. And I'm like, $8 million a year, huh? Okay. Yeah, for a guy shooting like 43, 44, 45% from three every year. A guy who in the playoffs had some big games for the 76ers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. I'm fine. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm going to keep it together. Not today. Not today. So, yeah. The Mavericks have some things to figure out. And I think this front office, with its new direction, obviously inherits the mistakes and the bad moves made by the previous front office. We just have to see what they can do. And things might look shaky early on. It's not like you pop in all these new pieces and it's seamless, especially when the overall composition of the roster changes and kind of its offensive attack and everything. But 
you do still have Luca. You got him on a five-year deal. You have time to work and navigate it. So, I don't know. That is about going to do it for my time, though. Let me see. I might have one more clip I can actually throw out. Let me look. I'm going to work a little bit here in the background. Don't mind me. Just minding my business. So, how are you? I get anxious and I just start talking at times when I'm trying to set up stuff. Uh, oh. Wait. No, it's there. It's there. All right. And one last clip for a quick closing comment. My agent knew that I wanted to be oh, a no, it's fine. I'm pretty sure the fans knew that as well. And just try to do the best we could to figure out a situation where I could stay and and uh, be a part of something special. And uh, I love playing with Luca. I love playing with KP. I play, love playing with all the other guys on the team. So um, it felt like home. So that's where I wanted to be. Oh God, the clip's already over. All right, I was I was clearly not ready for that one. But uh, yeah, Tim Hardaway Jr. at Summer League commenting on how he always wanted to be in Dallas. He knew, his, he, knew he wanted to be here. His agent knew he wanted to be here. And he's glad to get it here, uh, to get a new deal done here. He's glad to stay with the city, which he's come to consider like a second home. And he loves playing with Luka. Great mentality. And as I said before, Tim Hardaway Jr. took at least $16 million less to return to Dallas than he was offered to go to New Orleans and play with Zion Williamson. So, yeah. Yeah. You have a... Good shooter who, you know, your number three, some nights your number two option on this team, taking a lot less money than he could have gotten to come back here, play with Luka, remain in Dallas for the long term. And what's even better about that is if you look at the structure of his contract, it actually decreases year by year in terms of what his cap hit is. So he's getting the most of his money of the contract in year one versus year five. Most contracts grow over time his contract is the opposite his is going to decrease which for the mavericks offers more flexibility in the long term not just because it opens up more cap space down the road you know even if we're talking only like by marginal degrees but it gives more flexibility to what you would want to do what you would need to be able to do uh in terms of roster building around luca and all of that i was trying to see if i had the exact figure in front of me I have it somewhere, but I don't have eyes on it right this minute. It was a tweet from Tim McMahon, Tim McManigan, talking about what Tim Hardaway Jr. would make over the course of these remaining years of his contract. Huh? No. No. False alarm. False alarm, everybody. Wait. No. No. False alarm number two. False alarm number two. Did I bring the show to a complete stop down that's made it borderline unwatchable? You can tell me. It's all right. I'm a giver. I try to give as much great content as I can, and sometimes I get wrapped up in uh, the details. But I don't know. At this point, I'm starting to lose faith that I'm going to find it quickly enough to be worth calling out. So maybe we just let this one slide. All you need to know is that Tim Hardaway's contract decreases in terms of its, uh, its cap hit year by year, and that allows for more flexibility in the future. That's a, a testament to the new direction of the front office, how Nico Harrison was kind of able to work that out. Yeah, I give up finding this thing. I'm not finding it quickly enough. What do you expect this season from KP under Kid? Because last playoffs, he was not used properly. I agree he was not used properly properly last playoffs. I also think that this being his first healthy off season in three years is huge. He actually gets a chance to go under the hood, examine his game and work on his body. He hasn't gotten a chance to do that the past three years. He's been constantly rehabbing from some, some surgery or another, some injury or another. And so I think that's limited him. I think Jason Kidd really understands. He knows what he has in Luca. That's not a question. He has to figure out what he has in KP. And he knows he needs to figure that out pretty quick. So I think KP might arguably be Kid's top priority. And I don't mean that like, oh, he's going to neglect Luca. Like I said, he knows what he has there. 
But I think he's going to really try to rebuild and develop KP's game a little bit because as KP acknowledged himself in exit interviews last year, his game has not evolved enough from when he came into the league. And because of that, what made him stand out and be just this otherworldly unicorn, if you will, figure doesn't really hold up at this point. He has to keep growing. And that is why working with Kid, who obviously worked with Dirk through Dirk's most dominant years, I think is really big. I think that's important. Now, obviously, if you have a situation with, thank you, Tomorrow Sports on uh, the Hardaway thing, 21.3 million this year, 19.6 in year two, 17.8 in year three, and the fourth year, 16.1. That's really, really good. That's significant uh, shifting of dollars and cents. So with that being the case, not in that regard, Davis, because you're not in my head, you have to consider that kid, if he can keep the psychological warfare that was written about in Giannis's biography recently, talking about kid as the coach in Milwaukee and even a little bit about kid in uh, Brooklyn, then you have reason to believe that he'll be able to help KP. He understands, having worked with Dirk so closely during Dirk's most dominant years, including the title year, he understands kind of what KP needs to do, like how he needs to work, what he needs to incorporate into his game. And I think you can have a little bit of a, a mutually beneficial relationship in that regard. Damn it! Oh, Davis, you're in my head! Oh, rookie move! So... Oh, now I'm unglued. Okay, so I think he can work with KP and get closer to what we saw in KP's uh, stretch in the bubble. Not necessarily bubble KP, but a closer approximation of it. And I think they're going to make a concerted effort to get that. Honestly, though, I think they'll know by the deadline long term if they think it can work. Like if they think that kid... KP has a Maverick overall, but the relationship with Kid and Luca and KP, if that can work. And if it can't, then you might be looking at this following offseason. It's possible at the deadline something could happen, but I would say if, if it's not working out, they'll, they'll probably know by the midway point, and then they will, they'll know at that point in the offseason. Like, okay, we're three years into a five-year deal. It's more flexible. It's more movable at this point, and we might just have to kind of call it what it is. But that will do it for my time. I have already extended a little bit beyond what I can. I have an 1130 meeting and it is, oh my God, 1131. Well, I'm late for a meeting, so uh, I got to wrap this up. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. Consider becoming a member and a patron. All members and patrons are now listed in the outro of every stream and video. You will get exclusive content. Any videos that I do, whether it be an adaptation of my articles from The Smoking Cuban or if you're a Cowboys fan, Blogging the Boys will be adapted and put on to the channel. If you're a member, you get actually early access to it, at least uh, a, a day's worth early access because those both work on scheduled postings. And so you might actually, you might actually be able to see the video of the adaptation before the article even goes live. Just, just throwing that out there. Check it out, though. Check out my work, Smoking Cuban. That's a fan-sided website. And the Blogging the Boys, that is a SB Nation uh, there. But check it out. Until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace! Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs>